Good afternoon. We're going to get started in just a minute here. Hello, and thank you all for coming. My name is Paul. I'm with the Albany Library. And uh, welcome to Brown Bag Speakers Forum. So this is a co-presentation with the YMCA and the library, and we've been doing it for almost a decade now. Um, so I have two announcements. First is that we're being recorded right now for local cable channel KALB. Um, the show will be rebroadcast on Saturday at 11 a.m. and Sunday at 4 p.m. And also search YouTube for KALB Albany, and you'll see it up there in just a few days. And second, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our program for next month. So this is uh, author Neil Fiore of The Now Habit. He'll be talking about strategies that help people overcome procrastination, <laughs> optimize productivity, <laughs> while enjoying more time for play. He will introduce his process to help you move beyond procrastination, perfectionism, and workaholism so you can focus on your top priorities. We all need that. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Mary Delia from the YMCA. She'll introduce our speakers. Hello. I don't want to be in that light. Good afternoon. My name is Mary Delia, and I'm the Health and Wellness Director at the Albany Y. And um, I'm very excited about today's presentation. Um, Julie is a member of the Albany Y. It's always great when we have a member because it also just makes us remember what a rich and fantastic community we all live in and work in of people who do really interesting things. And sometimes you don't know what people do. And then, you know, since like, oh, you wrote a book. Wow, that's great. And oh, you have a story. That's even better. So um, when I asked her what she would like me to say for the introduction, um, she confirmed what I felt, which is sometimes when you do an introduction, you reveal too much. And then all of a sudden, it's like, well, that's the whole story. So I'm going to keep this short and just tell you that um, Rudy and Julie have been a couple for more than 25 years, and they've, been, they've taken many vacations. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> and as a lark, they began writing stories related to those outings. After Crater Lake, for example, they began a story called Lost in the Lava Tube. And Stumbling Stone, which is this book which they're going to be talking about today, started that way tr too after a trip to Germany. So I really look forward to hearing what they have to say. So please, please give them a warm welcome. Rudy Robb and Julie Freestone. Uh, so uh, it, it, it did begin as a lark, but it's quickly turned into a mission, as you'll, as you'll hear. So, um, and we have um, technology here that we have actually never um, used before, and... It works, doesn't it? Oh. There we go. Um, all right, so um, thank you all for coming. And um, I just want to say a couple of things about today is November 9th. Um, this was a, such a synergistic date for Mary to offer us um, because it's uh, the anniversary of Kristallnacht, um, which we're going to talk a little bit more about, but it's um, known as the Night of Broken Glass, which um, is the night that the uh, Nazis burned um, synagogues. synagogues and businesses and, and uh, deported. Could you, could you use the microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. There's, yes. Okay. There we go. Is that better? Okay. Thank you for coming. So um, we'll say more about November 9th, which is today, um, and was Kristallnacht in uh, 1938. So um, we just want to say a little bit about what we're going to be doing. Um, we are, we're going to tell you our story. This is a historical fiction novel, but it is based on our true life stories. So um, we're going to tell you our stories and then um, show you some pictures, and then we'll read you little excerpts from the book to show you how our true story segued into the book. Um, so that's the introduction, and you'll hear a lot more. All right. This microphone has a German accent, so I apologize for the. <laughs> must be something in the Volkswagen software here. <laughs> so um, just a, um, a little word, what you see there on the screen. The man on the left is Julie's great-grandfather. He lived in the Stettel, uh, a little village in Eastern Europe. And uh, the dude on the right side is my grandfather, who was a police officer before... Um, World War One, and that's his equipment. 
that <laughs> so they didn't use guns then. So okay. So I'm Julie. Um, I'm Jewish. I was born in 1944 in the Bronx, and my parents were Eastern European Jews who emigrated to the United States in the early 1900s. And they were very anxious to lose their accents and maybe their pasts. But I was very clear growing up that um, I was Jewish and that I had a specific culture. And, um, oops. Yes, that's my parents. Um, before I was born, I think. So um, when I was growing up in the Bronx, um, I lived with my mother and my father and my sister and my aunt um, in a two-bedroom apartment in the Bronx. And my father worked for the US government. He was a immigration lawyer. And his job was to examine um, people, interview people who were wanting to become citizens to see if they qualified. And he, uh, this will become important later in the story, but we lived in this two-bedroom apartment and he commuted by subway to his job in Manhattan and I imagine it probably took him probably a couple of hours to, to get there. So um, that was our life then and um, growing up I um, was taught never to buy German products. I knew we would never go to Germany and probably never to have anything to do with Germans. So um, in 1979, I moved to California, and eventually I became a reporter. And I was working, uh, that was, that's me growing up in the Bronx. You can see the Bronx in the background. <laughs> no, it's all right. Uh, so I moved to California. I was working on a story about the drug war in Berkeley when I met Rudy, who was a cop. He looked like the Gestapo, <laughs> a, a Hitler youth leader, something like that. He had a German accent. Um, and um, two things I never really wanted anything to do with, a cop and a German, a Nazi. But I was very intrigued by him and um, attracted to him. And, um, you know, I was a prejudiced free liberal, so I didn't, it didn't occur to me that a German could be anything but a Nazi. So, um, yeah, so he was, he was smart and uh, we were, you know, this is how life works. It didn't make any sense, but we started dating. I'll do it. So my name is Rudy, and I was born eight days after the cessation of hostilities in Europe. That would make it uh, May 16, 1945. That makes me a Taurus, right? So um, um, slide five. So when I was 21 years old, I um, left Germany, and I came to the United States. Um, for me, Emotionally, it seemed like uh, it took until uh, February 17, 1967 uh, for the Nazi empire to, uh, for me to be free from them because my father was a Nazi and stayed a Nazi. So uh, when I came here, eventually I wound up in Berkeley and at UC Berkeley, and there I earned a PhD in medieval German literature, which was excellent preparation for becoming a Berkeley city cop. <laughs> Uh, so uh, one of the first things that uh, Julie said to me uh, when we met was not, uh, what's your sign? Do you like long walks on the beach? Uh, do you like gourmet dinners? Uh, she said, no, what did your father do during World War II? So uh, that's how she is. Uh, so despite that rather strange beginning, I was attracted by her intelligence, her drive, and uh, she never stops. Uh, so uh, I wanted to know more. So let us now introduce you to the main characters in our stumbling stone. There is Sarah Stern, the Jewish reporter, and Karl Schmidt, uh, the German-born uh, cop. And we'll read you a scene uh, that takes place early in their romance. Okay, so once at the restaurant, Carl asked for the smoking section, ordered a drink and a hamburger, and raised his eyebrows as I waved the smoke away, and ordered chicken. This is an unlikely relationship, Carl said. Is it a relationship, I asked? His face fell and he looked crushed. I think it is. Do you have a problem with it? I nodded. I didn't want to hurt him. 
He was proving to be a gentle, sweet, and sensitive man under his brusque exterior, but I thought honesty was definitely in order. Apart from the differences in our styles, you smoking, eating hamburgers, and drinking too much, I'm still concerned about what your father did during the war. My parents, particularly my mother, never trusted Germans. When I was a child, we were never allowed to buy German products, wear loading coats, drive Volkswagens. I paused for a breath, and I added, German accents make me think of the Gestapo. Carl sighed. You know, I've said this to you before. All my adult years since emigrating to the United States, this issue keeps coming up. Jews who suspect me and my family of having participated in the atrocities. Non-Jews who fought in the war. Children of soldiers killed in the war. Others with good memories of propaganda films about Krauts. All attribute fascist traits to me. Assuming my looks are the window dressing for a Nazi mind. God, people even assume I served in the Hitler Youth, even though I was born eight days after the war. He sighed. You want to know what my father did during the war? I nodded. Of course I wanted to know. I held my breath. Was he actually going to reveal a secret? Did I really want to know? Carl continued, so do I, although I've given up wondering. OK, so um, let's go back now and continue introducing you to the, um, the sort of true part of this story. I love this sound. It's like a horror movie. That's my father. Um, he looks like the little boy on the front of the book, more or less. So um, uh, Rudy Raab Sr. Uh, he was born in Leipzig, Germany in uh, 1912. And his father, as I said, was also had also been a cop, uh, which I only found out a few years ago, a uh, little bit after my father told me that I was a failure because I became a cop. So. I don't know. So my father joined the NSDAP, the uh, Nationalsozialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, the Nazi party, uh, at the age of uh, 17, when, uh, I, that makes it 1929, and that's a full four years before Hitler came to power. So my father was an early adopter and then was privileged to wear the golden party symbol on his lapel. Um, so. When Julie asked him, uh, why did you join the Nazi party, he says, you know, um, after World War I, with the Versailles Treaty, Germany was punished and would stay down on the ground forever. And that's not fair. Eventually, Germany should uh, rejoin the nations as an equal partner. And uh, that's not possible. And, um, but it looks like the best chance to get uh, justice back would be uh, through the Nazis. And that's why I joined them. So. Since my father was an early adopter, he rose in the ranks and finally became a high-level uh, Nazi. And his job was to uh, run uh, the uh, Adolf Hitler Schule in Sonthofen, Germany, where the next generation of uh, Nazis, Nazi leaders was being uh, educated. They took the best, the brightest, uh, the strongest, the fastest, and the most, most ruthless boys and uh, brainwashed them. And, uh, that's the school. I took that picture in July from a single engine airplane flying over it. <laughs> Could have taken Mad Ludwig's castle, with it, which is about 20 minutes away from it, but this was more important for the talk. So um, next picture. The one with the propeller on her head, that's my mother. <laughs> OK. Um, and her mother and her sister. So. Um, my mother uh, grew up in uh, Bernderode, uh, a little insignificant town uh, on the east side of the Hearts in uh, central Germany. Uh, my parents, my father and my mother, were introduced to each other by the Nazi party so that they should get married and have the proper Germanic offspring. And as you can see in that picture, there's a hell of a lot of diversity. I'm the guy in the middle. By the way, see that little box? Uh, when my son was four years old, I went with him to Mr. Mops, uh, and uh, they had the same stacking boxes, and I picked it up, and it smelled, had the vinegary glue in there, still the same as it was 
70 years ago. Anyway, so um, um, that is my parents' wedding picture. Uh, we have a lot of pictures hanging on the wall on the left side. I say it's the Nazis on the right side. It's the Jews in the hallway, and they're looking at each other. That's right. So that's my father in his class A uniform and uh, his freshly minted bride and uh, the real Hitler youth on either side uh, giving the Sieg Heils. That's their wedding picture. He was proud of that. So, um, yeah. Uh, I remember on one trip we were in Italy, we were in Ravenna uh, on the campground. My father casually asked uh, one of my sisters uh, what they're doing in school now. She said, well, we're now starting history. He said, oh, history, that's interesting. Are they telling you that the Jews started uh, World War II, that uh, the Jews invented communism, like Marx and Engels, those are uh, German Jews living in London? Did they tell you that the stock market crash uh, was done by Jews? Are they telling you all that kind of stuff? So I kind of knew that my, what my father's persuasion was. Okay, so it looks um, like Rudy's family was a stereotype of the perfect Nazi family, except for one little odd thing, and that was his uncle Gerhard, his father's brother. Um, much silence surrounded Gerhard, which Rudy's going to talk about in a minute, um, and Gerhard eventually became uh, sort of the centerpiece of our book, Stumbling Stone. Um, so, and we're actually not going to say a lot about Gerhard because I think there are a fair number of people here who haven't read the book, and we don't want to ruin um, the suspense and the mystery. But um, anyway, so Rudy will talk a little bit about the silence. Not here. Um, so, uh, silence. That was a big thing in my family. Uh, whenever Gerhard's name came up, which was almost never, we were told that he had either had been a bad apple, or that he probably had been gay, or uh, that he most likely died of a mysterious disease at a young age. But it was clear that while my father rose in the ranks, his brother had not. In fact, his brother no longer existed. And we were absolutely discouraged uh, from asking questions. Um, so, right, we'll read a story. Uh, page 87. Okay, so this, this um, is from the early part of Carl and Sarah's visit to Carl's family in Germany, um, and sort of at the beginning of their relationship as well. So, um, Okay, as I was stowing my clothes away in my bedroom, Carl came in, walked across the room, silently motioned me over to the dresser and pointed to a framed picture on display. This is a picture of my father with his brother Gerhard. He spoke in a whisper, which I'm not capable of doing, um, as he held up the picture, turning it over, looking at it intently. This is when they were young, maybe pre-teens, I've never seen this picture out on display or any picture of Gerhard at all, except at my grandfather's in East Germany. I stared at the faded sepia tone picture. Why do you think it's out now? I don't have any idea, but I'm going to take a picture of it, said Carl, laying the photo back on the dresser and adding, maybe this means they're ready to finally talk about Gerhard and the past. We maybe have to do something different here. So um, uh, when we were in high school, um, imagine we were 17 and we were protesting nothing. We are going along totally with the program. We loved our teachers and yeah, right. We were more like the, the Zitz cartoon that you see in the paper against everything. So uh, in our history lessons at about 11 o'clock in the morning, we were shown uh, the movie clips and the photographs of the liberation of the concentration camps. And there were the victims standing behind the barbed wire, skeletons, uh, trying to understand what's going on. And in the background, you saw the non-survivors stacked up like cordwood. And uh, that was impressive. 
So then a couple hours later, you go home. It's lunchtime. You have your meal. And at the table uh, presiding is your father or my father, who I know from Ravenna is a Nazi and was a Nazi. And now I have to obey him. That was tough. So... Um, um, so when I got to know Rudy, and um, I would, he, would, he was surprised that I would tell people that I um, was reluctant to have a relationship with him. And um, it somehow helped if I could tell people about his uncle. Even though we didn't really know much about his uncle, the fact that I could say, well, you know, at least one member of his family wasn't a Nazi seemed to make it better for me that I was dating a German. So, the next time, uh, that should be, uh, we, we visited, uh, Julie asked my mother, uh, where were you uh, when little Boobline, that's what they called me, the little boy, uh, was born. And uh, so, uh, my mother uh, told her, uh, looking at pictures and reminiscing about the past. That's her without the propeller on her head. So this is her story, Ingrid's story. She became Ingrid in the book. Um, we had it hard during the war, we women. When Dresden was bombed, we knew we had to leave. The Russians were coming. I walked for 10 days, almost in a circle, to avoid the Russians. The first part of Ingrid's walk from Dresden to Pirna was for naught. By the time she arrived there, Ingrid found that the Russians had preceded her. So, still lugging her two little girls, she trudged on to Nanovitz, where her parents lived. She was nearly nine months pregnant with Carl, and Carl's two sisters were still in diapers. One day, I was walking by the side of the road. I don't know how many days into my trek that was. I was pushing one of the girls in her baby buggy. You know, she had had polio, and she couldn't walk. The other girl I carried on my arm, she had dysentery. And Bublein here, he was a few days away from being born. Ingrid spoke softly, remembering those difficult days. Suddenly, a Russian soldier had stepped out of the woods onto the road. He looked at me, and then he slowly raised his rifle until it pointed at my head. I thought it was all over, that he would kill me and the children. Just then, my younger daughter started to cry. I don't know why. The soldier may have heard the baby cry. Whatever the reason, he lowered his rifle and then vanished back into the woods. Ingrid stopped talking and looked into the distance. Then she turned back to me and said, yes, those times were hard, especially for us women. And how are those times for Gerhard, their oldest brother, I asked, leaning forward and looking intently at Ingrid. Was it possible I could get information about Carl's uncle this easily and this soon? The old woman was silent for what seemed to be a long time. You know, I never met Gerhardt. By the time Der Alter and I were married, Gerhardt was gone. I said, where did he go? He died. I think you should ask Der Alter for more information. He knows the whole story. The next time uh, we visited my father, I think there was the same visit, and we always do that in May around my birthday. So Julie interviews people, and so she says, okay. So uh, Julie asks him, um, what were do you doing uh, just before and on May 16 when Rudy was born? To our amazement, my father got up, walked across the room, took out a key, went over to a cabinet, unlocked it, and he pulled out his this diary, this one here. And he read excerpts to us from the diary and described the days before the war officially ended. So, I'll read you from my diary about that day and the days following, he said. I could barely allow myself to look at Carl and see a reflection of my own amazement in his face. Uh, Carl uh, could see the amazement in my face. Never had a diary ever been mentioned. The old man had never uh, once offered to describe any of his feelings or thoughts from that period. While we waited with hushed expectancy for Der Alte, 
that's what we call him, the old man, uh, to begin reading, Ingrid decided that he, she had had enough. She pulled herself out of her chair, mumbling about old Nazis, sighed heavily, and said good night. Amid the choruses of good nights and thank yous and see you in the mornings, the old man sat silently, opening the notebook to a page and peering at it. It was May 1st, and I was leading my unit south into Bavaria, hoping we could elude, elude the Allied troops and make it to safety in the German Alps. He said as an introduction before starting to read aloud, I was riding in uh, the sidecar of a motorcycle with my aide. It was very foggy. We almost missed the old farmer in the gloom. You! Have you seen the enemy nearby? I asked him in a low tone, squinting to see him. He was dressed in shabby clothes, and he carried a long staff. Yeah, the enemy is all around us, said the man, not bothering to stop where he was going. The Alde said wasn't clear, but he surely had no intention of lingering around and talking with a German officer. So... Reaching the top of the rise, I motioned to the aide to turn off the motorcycle. We coasted down this hill silently, and when we reached the bottom, the fog parted. And before us, there was an American tank. The soldier at the top lowered the machine gun in one motion, fired a burst in our direction, killing my motorcycle driver instantly. But because we were so close to the tank, the machine gunner could not lower his weapon enough to shoot me too. So, swinging his legs over the edge of the sidecar, he threw down his gun, put up his hands, and there in the Bavarian countryside, with the mist dripping off his helmet, the war ended for Friedrich Schmidt. So, he said, I was in a prisoner of war camp the day Karl was born. Two weeks later, eight days after we officially surrendered, Darada said, I did not know for several months about his birth, but on that day I wrote this, he said, reading from his diary. The war, as I expected, is lost, and now it is left for me to decide what I will do with the rest of my life. The school, of course, is gone, and it will not be possible for me to teach. I should like above all things to become an adventurer, try out different careers, travel the world, be carefree and footloose. It is true, I don't really want to find myself back in a family with the responsibility of children and a wife. There is so much more to do. Dalte was unaware that he was reading this excerpt to his son and that he was sharing his thoughts not of the magnitude of the carnage the Nazis has wrought or the shame that Germany once again was to experience, but instead his personal distaste for resuming the life to which he had to return. So, so there he was in the prisoner of war camp where he stayed for six months, and there was Rudy's mother um, in Nonovitz where she had given birth to Rudy um, with the two girls um, and the war was over and she thought she was safe. But um, the Allies had already divided up the country and the boundaries were not where the soldiers were when the fighting stopped. So the Americans left and the Russians came and she didn't want to be there with the Russians um, and so she left Rudy with his grandmother and um, she fled to uh, northern Germany, to Kiel, where she and Rudy's father had agreed to meet at some point. I don't know, we don't really know when they made that agreement, but um, so that, oh, I'm going. So my parents began to rebuild their lives and they literally did rebuild. If, um, on, on the front cover of our book, is on the right side is a picture of me. Uh, and in the background is the apartment house. It has uh, four stories. We lived in the fifth. Uh, that was a shack in the uh, attic. 
that uh, my father built out of salvaged uh, b uh, wood from other bombed houses. So anyway, you are not that. Okay. <laughs> so I, I was a year old when the war ended. And then um, several more years went by. And uh, I, this is uh, the Bronx where I was living, as I said before, with my parents. That's me with my mouth open. What a surprise. <laughs> and um, so my father um, was promoted and given a job um, which required him to go to Germany. And in 1948, he was transferred to Germany, and his job was to um, oversee the resettlement of the concentration camp survivors and other displaced pe pers people who had lost their homes and their countries and in some cases, their families. So my mother and my sister and I went with him. This is a picture of him at work. Um, they didn't have computers then, obviously. That he's tracking the um, transfer of uh, refugees who are um, leaving Germany. And I, I don't know if you can see, but there you can see the names of the places, Boston, New Orleans, that they're going. Um, and I have pictures at home of ceremonies of me saying goodbye to the 50, the 50th thousandth, I just say that, um, person who was leaving. So that, that was his job. And we, um, so we lived first in Bremen and then in Hamburg. And um, in Hamburg, um, Rudy and I lived at the same time, eight miles apart. We were the occupation forces. Rudy was the occupied. Um, we lived in a 40-room house. Remember the two-bedroom apartment in the Bronx. We lived in a 40-room house that had been owned by a shipbuilder. We had uh, at least one maid, maybe more, a chauffeur, a car. And, um, you know, Rudy, uh, as the uh, occupied, uh, certainly, I don't, they didn't have a car, for sure, or anything else. Okay, so... Um, it was a weird twist of fate there. So we were clearly on opposite sides and might have remained that way for the rest of our lives, even after we started dating. Had it not been for a series of reconciliation steps that we took together, and some of them we took together not knowing that we took them together. An early effort brought us together uh, uh, that was visiting my parents. Uh, Julie was not subject to the taboos in my family and uh, therefore was able to ask any question that she dared to ask or wanted to ask. But the advantage was that Julie didn't speak a word of German. Uh, she understood some of it, uh, but uh, I did the simultaneous translations. So therefore, I was allowed vicariously uh, to ask those questions which, which I never could ask. So sometimes my field of vision decreased and my mouth got dry, but I try to stay with it. And it's a difficult job to do simultaneous translation for uh, three or four days without stopping. You start to talk to yourself in the bathroom in two languages. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we uh, uh, asked those questions. I could ask those questions in the effort. Uh, that's chronicled in our book as one of the things, and it opened the portals to the past. So I'm going to read one last excerpt from the book, and it's particularly chosen for today, November 9th. Um, this happens again um, at uh, Carl's parents' house um, as Sarah and Carl um, visit to try to find answers to their, to Sarah's, mostly Sarah's questions, but Carl's too. So for the next few hours, we were tourists, strolling through along Heidelberg's main street, looking at the old buildings, listening to the hubbub of voices and accents. Hey, look at this t-shirt, I said. It showed the Berlin Wall coming down. I like t-shirts with historic significance. Paying the vendor, I slipped the shirt over my blouse. Carl gently laughed at my choice. He'd often commented that I wore my political opinions across my chest. I had shirts that promoted the use of condoms, shirts that proposed more money for schools and less for defense. Nelson Mandela shirts, no smoking shirts, more walking shirts, anti-war, pro-seniors, no drinking shirts. Once he said he was going to have a shirt made for himself that said, Liberalism is the most intolerant religion, just to offer a somewhat balanced view when we were walking together. After lunch, we took the streetcar home where the old man was waiting, seemingly eager to renew our discussion. Ah, oh, 
Very interesting, he said, looking at my Berlin Wall shirt. You know, the wall fell on November 9th. That was also the date of the 1923 Beer Hall Pooch, he said, adding almost in a mumble, and the date of Kristallnacht. Oh my God, I thought, reaching down immediately to peel off the shirt. The wall fell on the same day as Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass? Yes. Do you know what caused Kristallnacht? Deralta asked. I shook my head. I had heard about Kristallnacht every year since I had been writing for the Jewish newspaper, but I was too dumbfounded to respond. Of course, I would never wear that T-shirt commemorating the date that the Nazis had rounded up Jews throughout Germany in 1938, vandalized and burned their stores and homes. Der Alta ignored my reaction and continued with his story. Well, a German diplomat had been killed in Paris, and three people were involved in the shooting. One of them was somebody called Rosenberg. So what, I said, looking at Karl. What's he trying to say? That Kristallnacht was an uprising by the German people in response to that shooting? Karl asked his father the question, but the old man quickly shook his head. Oh, no, it was the stormtroopers' idea. They did it, and Hitler went along with it. He was like that. He often wanted peace, but he didn't always know how to get out of what others had gotten him into. Before I could ask another question, the old man went on. There was so much property destruction, the insurance companies complained, so Goering had to apologize. Then they had a trial and decided the Jews, with their business practices, were ultimately responsible and that they should pay for the damages. I was stunned. This was revisionist history at its worst. Although I had vowed to maintain a neutral position, to gather information, and not to debate his perspective, this was so patently untrue that I couldn't just leave it unchallenged. I decided to try a personal approach. Well, what did you think about that, I asked. I? I was a soldier in Dresden. I didn't even know about it, the old man said firmly. That was what I did. Okay. Oops. So, <laughs> okay. We started building a life together and build our build our traditions together, and uh, became a couple. Um, we celebrate Hanukkah. I make the latkes. We uh, celebrate Christmas. We buy the tree and decorate it together to the strands of uh, the Messiah, maybe. And uh, we celebrate Passover, and as a son of a high-ranking Nazi, I preside over the Passover. <laughs> so, um, um, in some ways, I call writing this book together uh, a team-building exercise. And we've become a pretty good team. So, um, we created a new narrative that blends our histories and pasts in a new future and give, gives voice in part three of the book to a forgotten victim of the Holocaust. So just a couple of housekeeping things and then questions. We're happy to uh, hear your comments or questions. Um, we do have a website called stumbling-stone.com and we do a lot of blogging on it. My mother wrote hundreds of letters when we lived in Germany after the war. And a lot of the blogs are about either her letters or Rudy's father's diary or other things that sort of relate to the book but aren't in the book. Um, and um, we do have a Facebook page where we also put up other sort of more casual things and people contribute their own um, comments about um, what is going on and what they think. And, have, we've asked a question a couple of times, is this story old news and are people getting sick of listening to this? And people have been pretty vehement about saying the story needs to keep being told. Except the Germans. The Germans. Uh, when I went to Germany in July and uh, told them about the website, I got pushback. Uh, the Germans say, well, 70 years ago, it's ancient history. Who wants to talk about this anymore? And, uh, but the Germans that emigrated to the United States, they see this as a story that needs to be retold. So, questions, comments? Uh huh, Tina? Okay, so excellent question. And the book was called Acts of Reconciliation for the 20 years that we worked on it, um, almost until it went to be printed. And then two things happened. One was that um, I registered the domain, Acts of Reconciliation, and I couldn't spell reconciliation every time I had to type it. And I thought, oh, this is awful. This is not going to work. 
And then... Well, in the month before we made the change, I said to myself, well, this was an okay working title. It's not really sexy, uh, but it's got to be something else. And uh, uh, my sister and I talked on the phone, and uh, she su uh, suggested, uh, why don't we put a stumbling stone for our Uncle Gerhard in front of uh, number 12 Gerhard Hauptmannstraße yeah, in, in, uh, in Leipzig now? Germans don't make uh, concrete sidewalks. They put little square stones in there and they're all scalloped like this in a beautiful pattern. And you can take one of the stones out and replace it with a, a brass plaque and with a name, uh, date of birth, date of abduction, and uh, the fate of the victim. And you put that in front of their house of the, where they last lived. So that's a stumbling stone, Stolperstein, it, uh, you start stumble across it, it inconveniences you, you look at it, and it makes you aware of what happened. So my sister said, why don't we do that? And I said to myself, that's a residential area. The same 120 people walk there to and from work, and after uh, four weeks, they don't see it anymore. It fades into the background. So I said, well, a literary stumbling stone would be the best thing. And so there came the enlightenment, and I came home and said to Julie, why don't we call it Stolperstein, the stumbling stone? And I explained to her what it was, and so there comes the title. And actually, there are many of, of those stumbling stones now all over Germany and in other parts of Europe. And um, on Friday, when we did um, a book event at, in Montclair, there were two different sets of people who had just been to Germany, um, one to install a stumbling stone for his grandfather in Nuremberg, and the other to visit a stumbling stone for his grandfather in Berlin. So, anybody else? Ellie. Um, so what was the process about getting this published? Did you have to persuade? Did you, were you turned down and then eventually? Well, we self-published it. And yes, we were turned down. And actually the person that I thought would be the most likely, an agent in New York, said it was an old story and nobody was interested in it anymore. And you know, I, I was kind of ready to let go of it. Um, Rudy felt like we had invested two decades of writing and revising and rewriting. And also, I mean, as it evolved and we found out more about his uncle, he, we really began to feel that we needed to give voice to his story um, because it was, his sisters were denying that there was any information available and they wanted to just forget about it and I guess this hardened our resolve to try to do something. But, and self-publishing is great. If any of you are nursing a book, um, we'd be happy to talk to you about why self-publishing worked so well. Somebody. That's a great question. She, the question was, do we have children, and have we told them the story? Um, I don't know if, <laughs> if you have this experience, but so we each have a son. Um, I would say that my son is singularly uninterested in the story, although somebody asked this question at an event that he was at, um, and the question was more like, what did, what did our kids think of the story? And uh, what he said was uh, that he thought it, this was just kind of some kind of you know, family project that would never see the light of day. And he was said, you know, this is really stunning. Here's a book and you are all, are all here and um, whatever. So, and, and we're actually going to Columbus, Ohio where Rudy's son lives on um, Thursday and we're doing a book event there. But his son, they, the kids don't seem interested in this, which is very sad. But I mean, I think they're amazed that we published the book, but that seems to be about it. Um, I wouldn't say actively rejecting it, but just um, kind of, well, well, you know, it's not my cell phone, so it doesn't exist. Um, but what I've noticed is that for some of the older writers, the grandchildren are starting to get very interested in it. I think it may be something like, you know, a first, correct me if I'm wrong for your experience, but sometimes 
the first born of uh, first born uh, generation in the United States like rejects old country stuff. And then it takes another generation for them to get interested in the language and the culture. I, not just that it's passed on, but interested. Hopefully the that's true. They want the background. And I'm hoping that will be so for you. We hope so too, but uh, my son uh, did not want to, uh, he was brought up bilingually. Uh, until he was four and a half, he spoke uh, German and English fluently. And depending on who, uh, into whose face he looked, you know, he just flipped the switch. And uh, then he, uh, when I got divorced, he stopped doing that. Uh, so I had to speak English to him. And later on, he took uh, surprisingly German in high school, and he learned some. And then he became the favorite grandson, grandson uh, of my mother. And he traveled almost every year to Heidelberg. And um, then uh, he wanted his birth certificate uh, because he was born in Germany and uh, to reclaim his German citizenship as a second one. And uh, then I suggested he get that for his daughter too, because she can get a free uh, education in Germany. You know, like Bernie Sanders says, <laughs> the Germans do it. So, um, um, uh, so he's in the process of doing that. And maybe one day, she's too young now, she will read it. But she's resisted learning German, so he's, he gave up. So somebody, I, yeah, go ahead. Oh, you're next, sorry. Well, it's, it's fiction, um, because there are things in it that are definitely not true. Um, my mother is a character in the book, actually, my mother died in 1953, and all of the dialogue that Sarah has in the book with her mother is based on my mother's letters. Um, Rudy's uh, f parents were actually divorced, but in the book they are not. And the biggest thing is, is that um, we did a lot of research on Rudy's uncle, but um, as the archivist in Buchenwald told us, people come there every year looking for answers, and then she had mostly has none. And we felt, you know, I, we, we, I mean, there was no way to really find out um, some of it. So we made it fiction for some of that. So, but um, uh, I went to the Berlin archives in Arlington, Virginia, uh, to look for uh, the records of uh, on my father and my. Uh, cousin's uh, father and then uh, we also did the uh, Red Cross tracing service to find out what's going on and I subsequently came across some postcards which were written uh, from the concentration camp Buchenwald. I know okay so uh, we uh, over the years uh, from the Holocaust Memorial Center and uh, Museum in Washington DC we got a lot of information so uh, we have 90% of the dots and uh, the 10% that we didn't have, we put it, and that makes it fiction. Okay, you, you've been waiting. I, I was just going to comment that I went to a conference here on campus on Friday, which was called Divided Nations Paths of Reconciliation, and a big part of it was the model of uh, Germany and Israel, of consul you know, the, the coming together and mutual benefits to each. And uh, one of the um, people who spoke, uh, who was at the University of Haifa, um, talked about the fact that it, it's very hard for countries to conciliate. <laughs> it's the people who create the bonds of, of reconciliation. Interesting. And that's the, mo that's the most important part. And you're like, Poster children. Poster children for reconciliation. She, yeah, I don't know if you all heard her. I'm going to tell her. Talking about a conference with Israel and Germany um, and reconciliation. We, uh, all over the world, in China, you know, Taiwan. So, so early on in our relationship when I was a reporter, my editor sent me to do um, a story about a project called Acts of Reconciliation. And um, uh, I... So I did the story, but the editor wanted me to go there and participate in this two-day event. And the, the drama therapist, Armand Volkus, who um, I was interviewing, said, well, you know, it's a, it's a therapy session. I mean, you can't just come and sit here and take notes. You have to participate. So he said, well, were your parents Holocaust survivors? And I said, well, they were immigrants, but they came before the Holocaust. And I said, but my partner is a German and his father was a high-ranking Nazi and he said if you bring him you can come. Oh. 
So that actually was one of the reconciliation steps that Rudy talked about that we took sort of early on. Um, and we did, we did participate and it was, it was a bit of a life-changing event, really. So I see some people shaking their head who know Armand, I guess. He, people, lots of people know him. Do you have a question? Yeah, I was just curious, why, what was your motivation for moving to the United States? That's a good question and I'm asking myself that from time to time. <laughs> when I was in seventh grade, uh, I learned the trumpet, to play the trumpet, and uh, that started uh, about an hour after school let out, so I had time to sit around, and I was reading a book, and uh, the janitor came through with her broom, uh, and she said, what are you reading there? And I said, well, it's a book. And she said, well, what is it? I said, well, it says, im nam des Gesetzes. It's um, uh, about an American sheriff, uh, and uh, um, he was a sheriff in western towns. He's a, currently residing in Colma. Uh, <laughs> why do I, right? Uh, so, um, uh, and I, she said, well, what? Uh, I said, well, one day I'm going to be a sheriff in America. <laughs> so that's maybe one thing. Uh, the other thing was... Um, More Monday. Uh, I just started medical school at the University of Göttingen in Germany, and my sister was there too, studying uh, German history. And she had a friend who was from UC Berkeley, an exchange student with the Education Abroad program. And uh, she was her roommate. So pretty soon we switched uh, roommates and I lived with her. And then we got married and that was my ticket to the United States. Because my parents cut off my support. <laughs> I'm a war bride. Is there anything else you can tell us about Gerhard? Uh, yes, it's in the book. <laughs> That's reasonable. Well, you know, it's interesting. So, so I will say one thing about Gerhard without giving anything away. Um, so part of the reason that Rudy's family, I think, had such a negative reaction um, to the project, because they didn't see the book. They went to the website. It, they, he had told them nothing, and then he introduced them to the website, and it was probably a month before the book was actually published. And, and I think they thought it was going to be, well, first of all, a stumbling stone about a Jewish Holocaust victim. But in some ways, the book is really a German story. Um, because even though the first two parts of the book about, are about Carl and Sarah, the third part of the book is about Gerhard, essentially. So um, I don't, maybe that'll tantalize you into wanting to read it, but that's, you know, that's as much as we can say about him. <laughs> Uh, yeah, right. Well, I, this is just a comment, you know, when they say it's an old story, here we have all these refugees pouring into Europe. It's not an old story, it's happening right now where things could go horribly wrong if people aren't thinking and watching and using them. And her point was is that, you know, it's not an old story because we have refugees now. And one of the blogs that I remember writing is, I, I find it really mind-blowing. So, okay, the war ended in 1945. My father went to Germany with us. He went first, but in 1948. We didn't come back until 1951, and we didn't come back because it was over. We came back because my mother was sick. I, I, my father continued to work from Washington on parts of this. How is it possible that those people were liberated from those hideous conditions and then lived in these DP, displaced persons camps, for years afterwards. And my mother in her letters describes the living conditions. I mean, dozens of people lived in one room. To, and that's just, and, and that, this is after what they went through. You know, so did we learn anything from this? I don't know. I mean, is any of this refugee um, condition now going to be advised by what happened after the war? I mean, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of displaced persons, but you know, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think your point is excellent. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, thank you for coming. We have some books. And, um, you know, we hope you like the book. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much.